Thank you. The next item of business is a statement by Michael Russell on the internal market. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of his statement, so there should be no interventions or interruptions. And I call on Michael Russell. Cabinet Secretary, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, on the 16th of July, the UK Government published a white paper on the UK internal market. The Scottish Government believes that the unilateral proposals made in that white paper without proper consultation with the devolved administrations are unacceptable and unnecessary. And therefore, I'm therefore grateful, Presiding Officer, for the opportunity to make a statement on the matter. Once we have seen the final legislation, the Government will provide a full and comprehensive rebuttal of what is intended. But there is enough in this document and enough information now coming from stakeholders about their concerns to make us believe that we must immediately start the process of defending Scotland against such a blatant power grab. The UK Government is allowing only four weeks for consultation on its proposals in the paper. This is clearly inadequate and is likely to prevent proper scrutiny. So can I say at the outset that whilst we will be submitting a clear note of our opposition to the proposals within the timescale and circulating that widely, we will also publish more comprehensive information as the issue unfolds, and particularly once the legislative consent process is underway. Presiding officer, the purported purpose of these proposals is to secure, and I quote, a UK-wide approach to ensure that the seamless trade across the UK's internal market is maintained by providing a market access commitment. But there is, in fact, no threat to that seamless trade. So this is a naked political ploy, a predetermined draconian solution in search of a non-existent problem. Two principles, mutual recognition and non-discrimination, well known in EU law, are to be enshrined in the new legislation. But far from, and I quote again, minimizing domestic trade costs, business uncertainty and bureaucracy, and protecting our national life, enforcing these principles in the way proposed will increase bureaucracy and make life more difficult for every business and consumer in Scotland. The real threat to the prosperity of these islands comes not from the devolved administrations, but from the current UK government. It is the UK government which is causing chaos, confusion and massive cost by its ideological pursuit of a hard deal, low deal or no deal Brexit in the midst of the worst recession in centuries and, un and an unprecedented pandemic. As of today, some five months before the end of a transition period that could and should have been extended, there is no certainty on tariffs, on customs, on cross-border flows of data and people or on regulations. In fact, presiding officer, the only certainty is that these new proposals would undermine the high quality and standards that Scotland has set for food production and animal welfare for the sole purpose of allowing the UK to do bad trade deals. That point was made effectively by the distinguished European jurist Sir David Edward when he observed the principles of mutual recognition and non-discrimination are not simple matters. For example, the white paper, he says, omits any reference to the principles of proportionality and subsidiarity, which are essential ways of balancing and reconciling conflict. And he also points to a huge volume of European case law and other writing on what he calls a highly complex and sophisticated subject. So these proposed changes undermine not just the basic foundations of devolution, but also all existing mechanisms for cooperation, the development of common frameworks, <coughs> and the entire list of devolved competencies. In reality, presiding officer, the actual purpose of these proposals is all too clear. The UK government intends to ditch the high regulatory standards we have enjoyed as a member of the EU and wants to do so without seeking consent from the people of Scotland. Now, and we can be sure that this is the purpose of the proposals because there is already a workable and constitutionally appropriate way forward to deal with any actual issues that arose from any threats to internal trade if those ever happened. That way forward is to do what we're already doing, to bring into effect the common frameworks currently being negotiated between the UK government devolved administrations in line with the principles agreed in the JMC as far back as 2017. Indeed, the white paper itself in paragraphs 87 to 94 sets out, that the, common sets out the common frameworks program and admits, and again I quote, that it is already creating an intergovernmental policy development and decision-making process which provides high levels of regulatory alignment in specific policy areas along with roles and responsibilities of each administration. That's paragraph 88. The paper also points out correctly that common frameworks can and do work within the devolution settlements and respect the democratic accountability of the devolved legislatures. The Scottish Government has engaged in good faith in the Cross UK project to develop these common frameworks in line with the agreed principles. 
We are not the ones who are now tearing up previous agreements in order to veto constructive discussion and impose an outcome designed and desired only by Westminster. What the UK government wants is not smooth trade, but to take back control. And not just from the EU, but from the people of Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland. And it certainly does not want anything to stand in its way, as it willfully dismantles, dismantles a high-quality system of regulation and protection we inherit from our years in the EU. The effect of the proposals would be to prevent this Parliament from requiring goods or services produced elsewhere in the UK to meet the standards decided on by this Parliament. In other words, if the UK government can simply change the rules for England, probably using the English Votes for English Laws procedure, which excludes Scottish MPs, Scotland would just have to accept that decision. Helpfully, the white paper itself even contains examples of where it could do so. On page 77, in the section headed Cost of Regulatory Divergence, there is a case study on deposit return schemes. On page 78, there is an example concerning food labelling. On pages 79 to 82, there is a case study on food manufacturing, which covers food hygiene, recycling, animal welfare, and environmental matters such as pesticides. And page 82 also specifically mentions minimum pricing as a regulatory restriction. And on page 85, the paper discusses building regulations and granting construction permits. That's a considerable range, presiding officer, and they're only examples. Of course, the mutual recognition principle is intended to be just that, reciprocal. The market in England uh, will have to accept standards set in Scotland, Wales, or Northern Ireland. But it is very clear that if that were ever to happen in a way that disadvantaged the current Tory UK government, before you could say the tail wagging the dog, we would find that only rules made in Westminster could change the market in England. Presiding officer, my final points concern the implications of these proposals for devolution and governance. There is no commitment in the paper to seeking legislative consent from this Parliament. No recognition that these matters are devolved or affect the competence of this Parliament. The paper clearly says in paragraph 154, the evolution and overall shape of the UK's internal market will be overseen by the UK Parliament and that key decisions will be put to the UK Parliament for approval. The implication is that anything in the underpinning legislation will be reserved from now on. This Parliament will lose any say, even on matters initially excluded, like minimum unit pricing. The legislation outlined in the paper will require legislative consent under the Sewell Convention, and the Scottish Government will be recommending, in the strongest possible terms, that this Parliament does not give any such consent, and that the UK Government therefore respects that decision in line with the rules of our constitutional system. The paper also makes clear the intention of the UK government to centralise control in other areas. Most notably and explicitly, the paper sets out its plans to reserve the subsidy control scheme regime. It makes clear that devolved administrations will have no role in designing that regime and that this parliament will have no role in approving it. Paragraph 173 says the future subsidy control mechanisms should be the responsibility of the UK parliament to determine. Again, reserving subsidy control will require the consent of this Parliament under the Sewell Convention, and again, the Scottish Government will be strongly advising this Parliament to refuse that consent, and the UK Government must respect that decision. And at paragraphs 128 and 182, the paper talks of clarifying spending powers of all levels of government and for the UK Government to construct replacements of EU programmes. Again, it does not take much thought to realise that these paragraphs mean, amongst other things, the shared prosperity fund replacing devolved responsibility for the current EU, EU structural funds. The intention is that those funds will become a reserve matter and solely controlled by the UK government. In all this, presiding officer, there is a consistent pattern emerging regarding the Tory view of UK governments. This insists on total freedom of action for the UK government unrestrained by any requirement to negotiate or compromise. It wants substantial constraint on powers presently held by the devolved administrations. That is the agenda, and it is being pursued with vigour. The Scottish Government is committed to cooperation, but it will not be bullied. There are alternatives to these ill-conceived proposals, including taking the Voluntary Common Frameworks programme to its anticipated conclusion. And finally, presiding officer, none of this was mentioned, even in passing, during the 2016 EU referendum, or indeed in the 2014 independence one. 
In 2014, where we, were, we were exhorted to lead, not leave. We were told that a no vote would deliver a better and fairer Britain. And of course, we were assured that our place in Europe was secure. In 2016, we were promised that this parliament would gain more powers, that we would be free to make our decisions. And even, and this is Michael Gove himself speaking in June 2016, that if the UK left EU then on migration, and I quote him, it would be for Scotland to decide when the reality is that the UK government are forcing through an end to freedom of movement against the explicit wishes of this parliament and the people of Scotland. Presiding officer, not a word that has been said to us in the last six years about these matters has turned out to be true. So it takes no great prescience to realize that all the promises being made now will be equally hollow. It is not too late for the UK to turn back from this route, but I can assure Scotland that if it does not, then this government will fight these proposals tooth and nail in every possible place and with no intention of giving way. I hope it will enjoy the support of the whole chamber in so doing. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. The Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement. I intend to allow about 20 minutes for questions, after which we must move on. The next item of business, can I ask members who wish to ask a question to, to email the business team now, as they did before. And I now call on Murdo Fraser. Mr Fraser, please. Can I start by thanking the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of his statement? However, any hopes that he would drop his hysterical and misleading rhetoric on this issue have been quickly dispelled. The UK internal market is vital for Scottish business and the economy, supporting over half a million jobs. Scottish producers need to be able to sell to our largest marketplace, the rest of the UK, without restriction or barriers to trade. Sadly, this government doesn't need to understand that simple point. They would rather engage in constitutional grievance mongering than consider what is best for jobs. And what we have heard today from the Cabinet Secretary simply reinforces the view of one of this government's own economic advisers, that there is no one in their ranks who understands business or the economy. So I have two questions uh, for the Cabinet Secretary. Firstly, not one SNP politician has been able to give a simple example of a power currently exercised by this Parliament which will be taken away by these proposals. There was nothing in the statement about that today, Presiding Officer. Can he do any better? And secondly, can he confirm that in relation to all the powers we are talking about, the SNP want to see every last one return to Brussels at the first opportunity. Cabinet Secretary. Starting off, so let me deal with the second question first. The SNP wants Scotland to be in the mainstream of Europe, to be a member of the European Union. Moreover, moreover, that is what the people of Scotland want because that's what they voted for and have repeatedly voted for. So if Murdo Fraser is not happy to be part of a, 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 a community of 27 nations, with our joining would be 28, that are free, is freely sharing decision-making, he is entitled to that position. But I tell you, not a single European nation within the single market would be treated or has been treated in the way that the UK intends to treat Scotland through this document. And that is clear from the analysis from David Edwards, which I quoted. The reality is there is no proportionality in this. There is no subsidiarity in this. There is no question of minimum standards. There is no question of national interest prevailing in terms of decisions. This is purely take it or leave it, because we know what we're going to do from the UK government. On the second question, let me make a point to this. This is a line, not an original line. It was Michael Gove's line last week, and it continues to be Michael Gove's line. And I'm sure Murdo Fraser enjoys quoting it. But actually, I could stand here all afternoon. In fact, I probably should just take Schedule 5 of the Scotland Act and start to read out what's reserved and then talk about everything else. Because every single power that the Scottish Parliament has can be undermined and taken away by these proposals. Every single one. I've mentioned food standards, but let me just go, presiding officer, to what I said in my statement. Clearly, uh, Murdo Fraser wasn't listening. Cost of, uh, there is deposit return schemes. Food labelling, uh, food manufacturing, food hygiene, recycling, animal welfare, environmental matters such as pesticides, uh, minimum pricing, building regulations, granting construction permits, all of them, and all of them are actually in the white paper as examples. So my advice to Murdo Fraser, my advice to Murdo Fraser and to Michael Gove is read your own white paper because that's what you're going to be taking away. I call Alec Rowley, please. 
Thank you, President Officer. The problem is that it is looking like it's take it or leave it, and that would not be acceptable, and it would be a failure to stand up for the rights of this Parliament and for the people of Scotland to simply take it on the instruction of Boris Johnson. I would have thought that one bit of certainty that the whole country would want at this time would be that our NHS will never be on the table of any trade negotiation. But the Tories, with their majority in Westminster, have ensured that there is no safety net for our NHS when it comes to future trade deals. This is not right, and there are many aspects of this white paper that are not right. We need to see what the legislation brings forward. But can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, do you agree that we must establish the principle that where we are dealing with devolved areas that require a common framework to be put in place, then that common framework must be agreed by the administrations of the UK coming to the table as equals? And does he agree that the best way to protect the internal market is by the collaboration and cooperation of all nations? Cabinet Secretary. I agree, uh, Presiding Officer. I think Alec Rowley has two very significant points there. The first one is that the negotiations on the frameworks continue. And it would be perfectly possible in that favourite word of, uh, of the Tories to intensify those negotiations to complete that task before the end of the year. Uh, and there will be no difficulty in so doing. The number of common frameworks which we agreed that we would need uh, was 24. There is a difference about state age, but we could get all that work finished. And indeed, I know that that is the Welsh Government's view as well, that we could do that job. And we will be part of that. What we won't be part of, what we won't allow to happen, is the power grab. There's a second point the member makes about public services, which I just want to dwell on for one second. Martin Callanan, Lord Callanan, uh, in the House of Lords yesterday, uh, answering a question from David Wigley, gave the game away on this. Because when he was asked if there was any dispute resolution procedure within these proposals, he said, no, we have a fine court system. I presume he was referring to the English court system. Uh, I'm not sure he knew there was a Scottish court system. Uh, there's a fine court system, and it can, it can have its place. What that does is it opens the door to any company, particularly coming into the country after a trade deal, to say about public services, Scottish public services, no, no, that's not fair. We are allowed to compete for these because we're allowed to compete for themselves at the border, and therefore we will insist upon that in Scotland. So the courts will be used, unfortunately, by such unscrupulous company, companies to undermine Scottish public services. And why? Because the Tories are going to allow it to happen. Indeed, they're going to encourage it to happen. Thank you. I have 15 minutes and 11 members, so please can I have short questions so everyone can get in. Patrick Harvey to be followed by Willie Rainey. Mr Harvey. I'm grateful for the advance copy of the statement, and very clearly this white paper is a profound threat, not only to Scottish democracy, uh, but also in the words of the, the Welsh Minister for European Transmission, uh, uh, Transition, uh, it facilitates a race to the bottom on standards from their perspective as well. Isn't it the case also that in combination with the UK government's trade bill and its policy in that area, this potentially locks in all future governments throughout the UK to the, the same race to the bottom agenda because the people in government in the UK at the moment recognise that their failed free market ideology is incompatible with strong governments that are able to regulate in the interest of the environment, human health, uh, or, or public services. They recognise that's a fundamental contradiction and they want to stop all future governments from having the power to act democratically. Cabinet Secretary. Absolutely, there is a strong deregulating agenda south of the border which is designed uh, uh, to encourage private profit, profit, mostly from their friends, and in those circumstances they are determined. They are determined. I'm not going to resile from what I think is blindingly obvious. And in those, in those circumstances, what they are trying to do is to drive deregulation down the throats of administrations who know that having strong public services and ensuring there is effective regulation is the right way forward, as indeed, right across Europe, countries know that. The odd one out is the UK, and the UK is determined to try and make sure that it gets its way with Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland. And we will not allow that to happen. Willie Rennie, followed by John Mason. It is deeply frustrating that the UK government continues to be cack-handed in its relationship with the Scottish Government. Surely what we need is an effective dispute resolution procedure between the nations and regions of the UK to agree the way ahead on areas of common interest like this. It's what we've argued for before. It would be good to have the Scottish Government's support for that proposal. Cabinet Secretary. 
entirely support that proposal. As part of the uh, intergovernmental review, presiding officer, I can tell this chamber that there was meant to be that at the heart of the, the new proposals on uh, governmental relations. And there's two problems now with that. One is that nothing has come from the UK government. We have been waiting to see this document for months. Uh, you know, it has had a gestation period much longer than an elephant. And we have nothing at all from the UK government on these matters. But the second problem in this is what Martin Callanan said yesterday in the House of Lords. If there is going to be an entire reliance upon the courts for these matters, there can be no effective dispute resolution procedure because it will be overruled by the courts. So in these circumstances, I am happy to say, and to make common cause with William Rennie on this, if the UK government was to bring a, a dispute resolution procedure and a set of arrangements that treated the four nations of these islands as equals, we would be there to agree it. You know, we have other ambitions, but we'd agree it. Of course we would agree it. The Welsh would agree it. But they're not bringing that forward. What they want now is simply to intervene legally to stop us doing things. And I do hope we'll have the support of Willie Rennie and his party in resisting that. John Mason, followed by Donald Cameron. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, can you confirm, it seems to me that within the EU, for example, with structural funds, we had quite a lot of freedom as to how to act uh, within a, a, a framework. Uh, whereas now it looks like within the UK, with the Shared Prosperity Fund, that we're going to have virtually no freedom to move at all. Cabinet Secretary. I think that's an inevitability of where the UK government is personally going, and we must oppose it very vigorously. Uh, the idea is that the, uh, the, the Scotland office and the Welsh office would uh, administer these funds, building an empire for the Secretary of State for Scotland and the Secretary of State for Wales, and ignore the devolved administrations. These are funds that are already administered by the devolved administrations. And there's not been a single argument in favour of taking them away. They should be administered in anything more simply and closer to people. But, uh, you know, the Secretary of State for Scotland wants to have his empire, and he wants money to fund that empire, and that's where he's looking to get it. Donald Cameron, followed by Joan McAlpine. The Fraser of Allender Institute estimates that over half a million jobs in Scotland are supported by demand for our goods and services from the rest of the UK. Given that, and in light of the fact that the Scottish Government withdrew from work on the UK internal market over a year ago, will the Cabinet Secretary commit to working with the UK Government to establish common frameworks that will prevent unnecessary damage and thus avoid putting hundreds of thousands of Scottish jobs at risk. Cabinet Secretary. I'll take the positive part of that question first. Of course, if, the, if Donald Cameron is capable of persuading, and he is a persuasive man, if he is capable of persuading his colleagues south of the border to withdraw the, these proposals and to return to the table on common frameworks, then I will support that. And I've made that clear. I'm, I've never left a table on common frameworks. We withdrew from the discussion of the internal market because it was obvious where this was going. Uh, you know, it was absolutely obvious. They intend, the UK government intends to, to, to oppose. Uh, we made it clear on common frameworks we would not have them imposed. But for two years, over two years, we have been able to agree on common frameworks. And indeed, every three months, the, um, uh, the, the relevant Secretary of State in England, it's presently Michael Gove, has to publish a report that says the common frameworks material is going ahead and there's been no need to impose. impose. That's happened in every single report. Now we cannot say that because what they will now do is try and ignore that and impose this. So if Donald Cameron can persuade the UK government to withdraw this badly drafted and, uh, and malicious white paper, then I will agree to that. But if he cannot, then I won't. Joan McAlpine followed by James Kelly. Thank you. The UK government has signalled its intention to grab powers to set laws around state aid. What are the implications of this for the Scottish Government's ability to protect strategic industries and jobs here in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. It is essential that there is an effective state aid regime. Uh, and moreover, given the role that the Scottish Government has had in industrial strategy and in, uh, and in developing and building business in Scotland, it's important it is done with a knowledge of the Scottish economy. And that is why state aid has devolved. Uh, you know, and, and the reason that the UK government want to reserve it is because they, they either wish to create a much lighter regime or maybe no regime at all. People may have seen speculation in the press that this is being driven by Dominic Currings and what he wants is no state aid regime. Now, they won't be able to get an agreement with the EU if they insist upon that, but that may be where they are going, to have no regulations. And why would they have no regulations? Because they could spend money willy-nilly on buying votes. That's the reality of it. That's what they will endeavour to do. So we need an effective state aid regime. Again, common frameworks can provide that. 
So if Mr. Cameron is compiling a list of those areas where work could be done, here's another one he could put in. We could have that discussion through the common frameworks on a state aid regime. But they will have to, the UK government will have to withdraw what is in this paper because that is a naked paragraph and it is trying to find a solution to a problem that does not exist. James Kelly, followed by Kenneth Gibson. The, uh, the, the, any, uh, uh, the devolution settlement must be protected, um, but any change to powers or trading relationships uh, must give regards to economic impact. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what tests the Scottish Government propose in order to ensure that any changes to powers will also protect jobs and economies within the UK internal market and also within Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. The member is aware that devolution has the established constitutional order. It has checks and balances within it. Uh, but the, the, those checks and balances do not prevent internal trade. In fact, it's quite obvious internal trade has grown uh, since devolution was established. But they allow priorities to be set. So anybody who is endeavouring to impose something different as the UK government is trying to whip up fears about the UK internal market which are non-existent. But of course we will publish, as I've said, over the next few weeks and as this process continues, more evidence that will show that the frameworks process is the right process to go through. I will also indicate the positive nature of ensuring that by using the frameworks we can encourage economic, some economic activity. Remember, however, and I'm sure the member does remember, that Brexit will be economically disastrous. So we will be doing this against a declining economy and the UK government will not only have the disaster of the COVID recession, it will have a self-inflicted disaster of a Brexit recession as well. It will be very hard to cope with both. In fact, it will be impossible to cope with both. Gareth Gibson, followed by Alexander Burnett. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. One of the powers the UK Tory government seeks to deny Scotland to our obvious detriment is the ability to decide on where to provide subsidies impacting directly on this Parliament's capacity and capability to support our economy. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide an example or two where such interventions have taken place which in future will be at the mercy of capricious Tory ministers? Cabinet Secretary. Well, quite clearly there's an, there's, there's a, 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 an elaborate cross-government uh, process uh, where money is uh, allocated and used in order to develop um, either industry, business, uh, agriculture, fisheries. And in these circumstances, that's a sensitive matter. The, the, the way in which money comes in and the way in which other monies come from elsewhere has to be judged carefully so it does not distort competition. And a knowledge of the, uh, uh, of the economy is extremely important. If you take that elsewhere, which is what is probably going to take place, in fact, that's what they want to take place, then there will be that lack of knowledge and they will not be able to do some of the important things, encouraging, for example, small and medium-sized enterprises, and encouraging uh, uh, the growth of the digital sector, or, or encouraging something like crofting, you know, which is something that's dear to my heart. Uh, that will not be able to be possible if there, is a if there is a state aid regime which is administered from elsewhere by people who know nothing about it. Alexander Burnett, called, followed by Gordon MacDonald, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Now, this subject is clearly going to be a lengthy source of grievance for nationalists. Uh, and as for his comments on constructive engagement, you know, last year it was the Cabinet Secretary who pulled his civil servants out of joint work with the UK government to strengthen the internal market. On the spurious grounds, there was no such thing. So as a starting point, does the Cabinet Secretary now accept there is a single market and it's his position that puts this at risk? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, not surprisingly, I don't accept that. But, uh, of course, the, the member needs to be accurate in his terminology. Uh, the question of whether there is a single market, on the definition of a single market that's understood in Europe, the answer is no. Is there an internal market? Yes, there's an internal market. Uh, can you trade across uh, different uh, regulatory regimes in an internal market or globally? Yes, of course you can. So unless the member is, believes that there should be no trade across any different regulatory borders or systems, his position is, shall we say, incoherent. Gordon MacDonald, followed by Claudia Beamish. Thanks, Presiding Officer. Scotland is a world-leading food and drink sector which is renowned for its high quality. Much of the growth in the sector is down to its excellent reputation. Does the Cabinet Secretary share my concerns that if the UK Government accepts lower standards, then this hard-won reputation could be compromised? Cabinet Secretary. I, I do accept that, and I know that's also the view of, of many uh, niche food and drink manufacturers, and more widely, the industry itself. Uh, there will be very substantial concern about this. 
and in these circumstances the right way to defend that is to have means by which you can defend uh, niche or, or growing industries. One of the great successes in Scotland in the last 10 to 15 years has been the growth of, 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 of Scottish food and drink. It has been wonderful and we know many, many producers who do exceptional jobs and do exceptionally well. Their livelihoods are put at risk by these proposals. Claudia Beamish followed by Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I emphasise the four EU environment guiding principles of precaution, prevention, rectifying pollution at source and on polluter pays, with which I know the Cabinet Secretary agrees? What, in his view, is the best way to maintain and build on European standards for our environment across all four nations, and of course, in relation to devolved issues, and to try to ensure that the common framework reflects these? Cabinet Secretary. I think, the, I think the member for that very good question, and, and she and I both share a, a passion for getting this right in terms of environmental regulation. Now, the, you know, the Cabinet Secretary for, for, uh, for, for the Environment is bringing forward with me uh, the Continuity Bill, which will have proposals about keeping pace with European environmental regulation. But we should also make sure, and of course the Northern Irish Administration in terms of the regulatory standards that they will have the EU will also be keeping pace and, and developing alongside EU standards. We need to make sure that we can square that circle through the framework process, and we do that by negotiation. What this actually does is simply sweep that away uh, and say we're not interested in negotiation, we're going to impose standards that are set at Westminster, probably without involving Scottish MPs. That is the worst way of doing things. And I'm glad the member, I think the member is going to support us trying to stop that happening. And Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's clear that Scotland's democratic decisions have been actively undermined by the UK Government. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that the only way to properly protect Scotland's interests is by becoming an independent country? Cabinet Secretary. Well, um, I, uh, as, the member, as the member knows, uh, it's amazing when a word of truth is spoken how Tories get it, uh, really get excited, isn't it? They can't really take a word of truth. I've spent my political career believing that Scotland should be a normal nation. I don't resolve from that in the slightest. But I do also know there are people in this chamber who do not agree with me in that. And people who do not agree with me, but who recognize the importance of devolution, as we've heard from Labour members, we've heard from Liberal members, uh, then I am very glad to work with them to make sure that the devolution settlement is protected. Because without the devolution settlement in place, then we will have even more problems. That is the nature of the agreement that I have sought and have on a practical basis, for example, with the Welsh government, the Welsh Labour government, who we do not agree. Mark Drakeford and I very early on said we do not agree on the final destination. But we're on the same journey here. And we're on the journey to make sure that our countries can eff have effective legislatures and can protect and promote the good things in our countries. So I welcome that collaboration. But will I ever walk away from the idea of independence? No, and it's coming yet for all that. Thank you. That concludes questions on the statement. And as there is no other business, I close this meeting of Parliament.